The story of P.T. has been something of a difficult thing to unravel. The plot isn't exactly given to you on a silver platter, opting instead to reveal bits and pieces of itself throughout the game, par for the course with most Silent Hill games. Because of this, there's no one correct plot synopsis, and by extension, this video has a large amount of guesswork and speculation about what these details mean. But if you follow P.T.'s narrative breadcrumbs, you'll be able to get an idea of what's happening inside P.T.'s halls. Let's first look at the facts the game presents us. We'll start by examining one of the main connections the game makes with reality, fathers murdering their families. There are various types of horror. Most deal in fantasy, involving things that would never happen in real life. But some of the most effective horror plays off very real fears and has a basis in reality. Actually, a lot of horror uses the based on real events line to establish a link to reality, telling its audience, this could happen to you. PT is no different. During the first hallway loop, a radio broadcast tells the story of a gruesome murder of a family at the hands of the father. The day of the crime, the father went to the trunk of his car, retrieved the rifle, and shot his wife as she was cleaning up the kitchen after lunch. This is followed up with two other stories of fathers murdering their families, and wraps up the broadcast with State police say this string of domestic homicides appears unrelated, though it could be part of a larger trend such as employment, child care, and other social issues facing the average family. In reality, this act is called familicide, and is the most common form of mass murder. By saying that this could be part of a larger trend, the game is likely pulling a based on real events, and establishing a basis in real life. This allows for a deeper, more basic, and longer lasting sense of fear, that this could happen to you, as well as calling into question the mysterious reasoning behind familicides. The game posits that employment, childcare, and other social issues could be the motives for these murders, and in reality those are contributing factors, but when applied specifically to the events of PT, they make a lot of sense. We'll talk about this more later on in the video. An interesting thing to note about this is that linking events that happen in-game with events from real life is something Hideo Kojima loves to do with the Metal Gear Solid series. In it, Kojima regularly takes items, places, and events from real life and constructs narratives around them. Speaking of which, later in the game, the same radio that described the murder from before starts repeating a number. Well, a radio broadcasting seemingly random numbers is another concept that has bearings in real life. Numbers stations are shortwave radio transmissions that began popping up after World War II. Mimicking transmissions that sent weather data during that war, number stations are believed to have been used by governments to transmit information via encoded messages to spies. At least, that's the best guess. No one knows just what the hell number stations are for a fact, and listening to them often raises more questions than answers. Pretty damn creepy, huh? Anyway, probably the most striking aspect of PT is the limited amount of locations the game includes. PT takes about an hour to complete, or around 15 minutes if you speedrun it, and throughout that time you're given access to two major locations, the concrete room and the repeating hallway. It's worth noting that there are two things about the hall that have appeared in Silent Hill games before. Doors that lead to nonsensical places, sometimes in a looping fashion, and a theme of descent. The repeating hallway, when mapped out connected to itself, is actually making the player subtly descend in a spiral pattern. In earlier games, this was symbolic of a mental or emotional descent, delving into the mind to perhaps unearth lost memories. Anyway, fun references aside. The first location we're introduced to is the concrete room. In it are a few notable things, such as a small wooden table with a bloody brown paper bag on it. It will talk to us at certain points in the game, but we'll talk more about the bag later. Another curious thing about this room are the tally marks on the wall, which seem to indicate someone counting something in here. Additionally, if you stand silently in this room, you'll be able to hear the sound of something scratching at the door, or possibly creating new tally marks on the walls. Exiting the concrete room's only door will lead us into the repeating hallway, which is the main location of PT. 
The hallway is presented in various ways, but the point is always the same. Investigate everything. Puzzles in PT require you to really scour the hallway for clues, which has the added effect of familiarizing yourself with the area. Let's go ahead and review the information the hallway is presenting us. Probably the first thing you'll notice about the hallway is that it belongs to someone. This can be deduced by the personal items laying about. It can be inferred that the hallway was at one point part of a house that belonged to a married couple, whose wedding photos, as well as other personal pictures, can be seen throughout. These pictures seem to be fairly old. They're all faded, grainy black and whites of people in older styles of dress, but not too old. The style of dress in the wedding photo matches the wedding fashions of the 1980s fairly well. There are also other pictures hanging throughout the house that are sometimes in full color. A lot of them are mundane sceneries, but others are odd, depicting blurred figures, or this one, which is an upside-down photo negative of a tunnel. There's also a digital clock toward the beginning of the hallway that reads 2359. It stays stuck like that for a large portion of the game, but during the other hallway loops, the clock gets stuck at 000, midnight. During the final loop, the clock starts at 2359, but after a minute from entering the hallway, a clock will chime 12 times, and the digital clock will change to read 000. Leaving the final hallway loop resets the clock back to 2359. It's interesting to point out that midnight marks the start of a new day, and this flux between two days may have been an intentional theme. One of the more intriguing elements of this hallway is the various cans of beer strewn throughout it, indicating that someone who lived here possibly had a drinking problem. While it doesn't seem to come into play much, it appears to be raining outside the hallway. This was likely done to set the mood of the hallway and add an interesting soundscape for otherwise silent moments in the game. Despite being locked at the beginning of the game, the bathroom opens up on the sixth hallway loop, and there are a few interesting things inside. Most notably, a live bloody fetus in the sink, which talks to you at another point in the game, but we'll go over that in detail in a bit. Another interesting thing is the bathtub, which when first seen is full of water, but is later emptied during the red hallway loop. There's also a hole in the wall above the bathtub, which at one point the player looks through to hear the murder of a woman with a bladed object after being held underwater in the bathtub. I say bladed object because you can actually hear the sound of the blade during this scene. As the player progresses through PT's looping hallway, certain things will change. Like the picture of the married couple near the front door having gouged out appear on it along with a big blue X. There's also a large refrigerator that seems to have something rather bloody inside of it. And on the loop after the fridge first appears, you can see it swaying frantically back and forth with a baby crying in the background. It's possible this has symbolic meaning to PT's manger antagonist, which we'll detail momentarily. Another change that occurs is when the hallway gets bathed in a red light and the player character moves much faster than normal. During this loop, all of the pictures in the hallway are changed to depict eyeballs. This is likely a hint to the player on how to solve this loop's puzzle, which requires you to look through a peephole. Now that we've covered some of the major locations and themes in PT, let's go over the characters that appear throughout the game, starting with the character you play as. You know, that Norman Reedus lookalike. Firstly, it's likely that the character you play as is the person walking around the town at the end of the game. Evidence for this can be seen in multiple places, First at the beginning, where you see the player character wearing a jacket that looks to be the same one Norman is wearing in the final scene. Additionally, in the red hallway loop, you can enter the bathroom and get a slightly better look at your player character in the mirror. Looks a lot like Norman, doesn't he? The next character we'll discuss is the ghost that terrorizes you throughout PT, whose name appears to be Lisa. This was confirmed by Kojima himself while showing off the Lisa decoys in the upcoming game Metal Gear Solid The Phantom Pain. But additionally, the name Lisa appears in PT written above the loop door in the quote, Forgive me, Lisa, there's a monster inside of me. Who exactly wrote this above the door is unknown, but the context of it seems to indicate that it was Lisa's husband expressing regret that he murdered Lisa and their children, as detailed in that radio broadcast from before. 
Physically, Lisa appears to the player as a woman with short black hair wearing a bloody white dress. She has unusually long legs and is wearing a single high heel on her right foot. She's also missing her right eye, which seems to be related to the gouge it out puzzle, as the eye being gouged out is the right eye of the woman in the picture. It can be inferred from this puzzle that the woman in the picture and the ghost haunting P.T.'s hallway are the same woman. Although the ghost and the woman in the pictures don't look the same, the gouge it out link, along with the radio saying that all the murders were unrelated in every way besides husbands killing their families, cause us to believe they are meant to be the same person. The ghostly form of Lisa also seems to be inspired by Japanese yurei, also known as, well, just ghosts outside of Japan. Japanese ghosts share a basically uniform design, thanks to Kabuki Theater developing a specific costume for ghosts. Black hair, although Lisa's is far shorter than the usual yurei hair, white clothing, and hands dangling lifelessly from the wrists, which are held outstretched with the elbows near the body. Though it's not the 100% correct arm position, she does have especially limp arms in general. Even in Silent Hill 4, when Cynthia was turned into a ghost, her appearance changed quite a bit, and she took on the form of a yurei, pale, long-haired, and limp-limbed. Of course, the appearance changes in PT can be somewhat hand-waved by the monsters, they look like monsters to you defense. And by that, we're talking about this cutscene from Silent Hill 3. Don't stand there looking so smug. You're the worst person in this room. You come here and enjoy spilling their blood. And and listening to them cry out. You feel excited when you step on them and snuff out their lives. Are you talking about the monsters? Monsters? They look like monsters to you? <gasps> oh no. Don't worry. It's just a joke which has been hotly debated as being either Vincent messing with Heather's head or Vincent letting some truth slip about the monsters in Silent Hill actually being real people you're murdering this whole time. Because Silent Hill makes them look like other, scarier things. But that whole, it looks different because the other world just does that sometimes argument can really suck the fun out of certain Silent Hill conversations. There's another puzzle in the game that involves a picture of Lisa as well. The photo fragment puzzle, which requires the player to search the hallway for six pieces of a torn up photo. On the torn photo are the words, my voice, can you hear it? This sign, can you read it? I'll wait forever if you'll just come to me. Collecting all photo pieces assembles them into another picture of Lisa. Another aspect of Lisa's physical appearance seems to indicate that she was murdered by her husband, as detailed in the radio broadcast at the start of the game. The blood on Lisa's dress appears around her stomach, and the radio broadcast states that the murdered wife was shot in the stomach, and also that she was pregnant at the time. This seems to explain the ghost of Lisa having an enlarged stomach, and could account for all the blood toward the bottom of her dress. Another Japanese ghost type, Ubume, is the spirit of a woman who died in childbirth, but shares another design similarity with Lisa. In form, it is soaked in blood from the waist down. Lisa's actions in PT make her an interesting character to say the least. Throughout the game, she goes from laughing after you've solved a puzzle, <laughs> breaking a window near you to freak you out, to just straight up murdering you by picking you up and snapping your neck. One would assume if her intention was to merely kill you, then she could do that at any time, but the game implies that Lisa wants more than to just kill the player character. At the start of the game, when the player character is getting off the ground, you can see what appears to be Lisa opening the concrete room's door for you. This makes it seem like Lisa is out to punish the player character for something, or at the very least, torture him for fun. Which is pretty similar to the MO of Silent Hill itself in the games. Whether it's a consciousness or not is debated, but it seems to be obvious that it could kill you at any point, but chooses instead to torture, punish, and try to teach something to whoever wandered into its grasp. Silent Hill as judge, jury, and executioner, as well as Silent Hill as a warped therapist, are both ideas we intend to discuss in later videos, though. So does the character you play in PT have anything to do with the central murder the game revolves around? Well, the man in the photos in the hallway doesn't really look anything like Norman Reedus, 
but the sink fetus seems to address you as the father who murdered Lisa and his kids. You got fired, so you drowned your sorrows in booze. The booze being a connection to the repeating hallway. Throughout it, you can see cans of beer strewn about, indicating someone there possibly had a drinking problem. Or at least a littering problem. Considering that the hallway seems specific to Lisa and her husband, a fair conclusion can be made that the alcoholic was Lisa's husband. All this meaning that the fetus at least thinks you're the man who murdered Lisa and his family. But at the end of the game, during the major reveal, the same voice who talks to us as the fetus starts talking about his father, not only as if we aren't him, but also as though we don't know who the guy is. Dad was such a drag. Every day he'd eat the same kind of food, dress the same, sit in front of the same kind of games. This plays into the confusion about who you play as in PT, which is encapsulated by the line we've heard a few times in the game, when the helpful bag says, The only me is me. Are you sure the only you is you? Another character of note is the paper bag that we just mentioned, who appears in the concrete room after you get killed by Lisa for the first time. What is inside the bag is unclear, but it appears to be wet with something, possibly blood. Whatever it is, it should be noted that in order to get the bag talking, you have to get Lisa to jump you and kill you. Afterward, you'll hear a small buckle moving, and the sound of a zipper being unzipped. It's possible these events are connected, and whatever is inside the helpful bag was taken out of the player character, like his spleen or his stomach. The helpful bag is also something that kinda sort of appeared in Silent Hill before, especially in Silent Hill 2. The dead guy in the streets with the diary pages talking about the creatures, the hospital director leaving you a wrench, key, and maps, the there was a hole here message, and the if you want to see Mary you should just die message. A mysterious benefactorish force that seems to have secret knowledge of the inner workings of Silent Hill but is not able or willing to fully expound on it. Anyway, the bag appears to want to help the player character, presumably because both seem trapped in PT's infinite hallway. The bag talks to us and reveals that the gap in the door, presumably the one in the concrete room but it's not specified, leads to a separate reality, and that the only me is me, though riddles like this one aren't exactly 100% helpful. A very interesting thing about the helpful bag is that the voice emanating from it seems to be the same voice providing at least a few of the audio clues throughout the game. Watch out. The gap in the door. We share an instant of private darkness. In the moment our hands overlap, I walked till I stood one pace before Jack. This could potentially mean that the bag is the writer of the other clues as well, considering they all tell the same story of a person who has figured out the final loop's puzzle but hasn't been able to leave yet. For example, I believe I heard a phone tells us that this person got the third baby laugh but may not have had a chance to pick up the phone and leave. Despite being a major character, not much is known about Lisa's husband. We know he killed his family, Lisa, their son, and their daughter, and there are a few pictures of him in the hallway, but we don't know his name, nor do we know the true motivations behind his actions. What we do know is that Lisa's husband wasn't the first husband to murder his family. During the radio report at the beginning of the game, we hear the following. There was another family shot to death in the same state last month, and in December last year, a man used a rifle and meat cleaver to murder his entire family. In each case, the perpetrators were fathers. This tells us that Lisa's husband's situation isn't isolated, there may be a link between at least two other murders. The motivations for the other two murders are unknown, but we may have some information about Lisa's husband that we can use to form ideas about why he did what he did. During the sink baby scene in the red hallway loop, we're told that someone got fired so they drowned their sorrows in booze. Since the hallway seems to be part of Lisa and her husband's home, Many have taken this to mean that the person being talked about here is Lisa's husband, and the woman being referenced, the one who took a job working a grocery store cash register with a boss who was possibly coming on to her, is Lisa. And remember, Lisa was pregnant at the time of her death, so it is possible that Lisa's husband suspected Lisa's boss at the grocery store to be the biological father of her child, regardless of whether or not that was true. Jealousy may have blinded him, but it's possible an outside source pushed him to go through with the murders. 
Another scene in the red hallway loop gives us another clue as to why Lisa's husband did what he did. During the peephole scene, we look into the bathroom as audio from a murder plays. In it, we hear a woman being drowned, then killed by someone. Presumably, this is one of the other husbands mentioned in the radio broadcast killing his family. But it's important to note that the audio of this murder is backed by a voice on the radio. Here, it appears this voice is urging this person to commit the murder. This, along with the other broadcasts, heavily implies that the radio also did something similar with Lisa's husband as it did in this bathroom scene. To further illustrate this, we hear the 204863 code coming from the radio, and during the first radio broadcast, we hear this. Several days before the murders, neighbors say they heard the father repeating a sequence of numbers in a loud voice. They said it was like he was chanting some strange spell. It seems like the game is hinting that the radio is either driving Lisa's husband insane with the 204863 puzzle, is outright urging him to kill his family, or both. Quick little side note about the murder. Lisa's husband is said to have lured their daughter out of the safety of the bathroom by telling her it was just a game, at which point he killed her. Well, this error screen that appears before the final loop says basically the same thing to the player. Whatever the reasons Lisa's husband had for murdering his family, it's implied that he is remorseful for what he did. At a certain point, this message appears above the loop door's frame. Forgive me, Lisa, there's a monster inside of me. This monster inside me is interesting considering the possession theme PT has going, what with Lisa's ghost possessing the player character at points in the story. But the main takeaway here is that it's likely Lisa's husband wrote this note, and he's sorry for what he did. Because, well, who else would be apologizing to her if not the husband? No one else seriously wronged her that we know of. That's assuming the implied affair with the grocery store manager was consensual, though. This whole thing is made more interesting by listening to the initial radio report again. It says, Police arriving on scene after neighbors called 9-11 found the father in his car listening to the radio. Not only is this placing even more emphasis on the radio's role, but it seems to be saying that Lisa's husband is still alive, if he wasn't put to death for his crimes. The radio at another point mentioned a man committing suicide after he killed his family by hanging himself in his garage. After killing his family, his father hung himself after with a garden hose they had in the garage. This hanging story conflicts with the listening to the radio in the garage story, so we either have the conclusion for two different murders here, or the radio is messing with us. I mean, I'm no expert, but I don't think an umbilical cord is strong enough to support a person's weight to strangle them or break their neck. Considering that a lot of the creepy stuff in PT seems to emanate from the radio, let's investigate it a little more by dissecting the various voices we hear coming from it throughout the game. First up is the voice we hear at the start of the game, the one heard reporting on the murder of Lisa's family. The day of the crime, the father went to the trunk of his car, retrieved the rifle, and shot his wife as she was cleaning up the kitchen after lunch. It's likely that this is the voice of an actual reporter being played back to the player character since one of the error messages later in the game indicates that the murder being reported happened 20 years ago. That or it's some mischievous character acting like a reporter to mess with this, but nothing in the report implies that. The next radio voice we hear is what we're calling the evil voice, since it's the one that punks us into a jump scare by saying, look behind you, which is one of the factors involved in getting us killed by Lisa. Look behind you. I said, look behind you. It may very well be the same entity as the reporter voice, but the way it interjects into the report after the first loop feels like someone cutting into a separate broadcast. On a Sunday afternoon. Don't touch that dial now, we're just getting started. Retrieve the rifle. Plus, this voice is more overtly evil, introducing us to the mysterious number 204863, which is likely the same number Lisa's husband was chanting around the time he killed his family. In fact, it's possible this voice is the one that drove Lisa's husband to commit those murders. Even in his first appearance, this voice is planting the seed of distrust by saying, don't trust the tap water. 
In addition, we hear this voice again during the peephole scene in the red hallway, where he's heard pushing someone, possibly a father, to kill. Another radio voice is one we've taken to calling the Swedish Ghost. This is the voice that talks to us in Swedish in the loop just before the red hallway. It has a different attitude than the other voices, which leads us to believe it's not one of the other radio voices pretending to be someone else. The content of the Swedish Ghost's message pertains more to helping the player character come to his world, which might not be such a great idea. This voice references the War of the Worlds radio broadcast from 1938, and, like the evil voice, tells us to distrust everyone, specifically the police. Despite that similarity, the Swedish ghost seems more genuine about its plea. It also wants us to solve the 204863 puzzle, and claims that we have the right to become one of them, whoever they are. Finally, there's a voice at the end of the game, which if you listen carefully, you can hear is talking with radio static in the background. Dad was such a drag. Because of this static, one could assume this voice is also coming from the radio, which will make sense in a moment. Who this voice belongs to is a mystery, but by listening to what he's saying, we learn that this is likely the son of a father who killed his family. But then one day he goes and kills us all. He couldn't even be original about the way he did it. Which dad he's talking about is left for the player to assume, but it's possible this is Lisa's son who was mentioned at the beginning of the game as having been shot and killed by his father. When his 10-year-old son came to investigate the commotion, the father shot him too. Another reason to think this is Lisa's son is because this same voice inhabits the fetus. Every day he'd eat the same kind of food, dress the same, sit in front of the same kind of games. Only reason she could earn a wage at all is the manager liked how she looked in a skirt. In this scene, the voice reveals detailed information about Lisa's husband and his drinking problem, as well as demonstrating intimate knowledge of the circumstances preceding Lisa's murder. Presuming they're true, of course, and the fetus isn't lying to us for some reason. It's because of this knowledge that we think we know the voice's name. In a previous video, we found that the key to solving PT is to say the name of someone who wrote a message to the player during the glitch hallway loop. This message ends by saying, contact me, J. Our theory was that 204863 is a code used to figure out this person's full name, Jareth. Because of the way the game resolves after you contact this person, it's likely that the final radio voice is Jareth. But as we've noted in another video, a few different names can be used to solve the final puzzle. So we're not 100% confident in saying his name is Jareth specifically. Instead, we'll refer to him simply as J, since at least we know his name starts with a J. An interesting thing to note about J's monologue at the end of PT is that, if you listen carefully, you can hear his voice start with radio static in the background, as we've already pointed out. But, by the end of his message, J's voice no longer has the radio static behind it. I'm not complaining. I was dying of boredom anyway. But guess what? I will be coming back, and I'm bringing my new toys with me. This is noteworthy because of his line about coming back, which is perhaps referencing his death by the hands of his father, and possibly draws a symbolic link between the world where the voices are broadcasting through the radio from, which seems to be the world of the dead, and the real world. Perhaps this is the reason Silent Hills is pluralized, as these two different worlds have gotten blurred. It's possible that Jay has found some way of bringing these worlds together, which may be referenced by his line about bringing his new toys with him, which could refer to his methods to bring these worlds together, or possibly the sources of the radio voices we've been discussing. Okay, everything we've talked about up to now has mostly been the facts presented by P.T., but it's here we start getting into 100% theoretical territory. 
While these theories are based on the ideas presented in PT, it's important to make the distinction that they're just theories, they're not facts. They're fun to think about, though. The first theory to discuss is the timeline for PT's events. The inception for this theory was reading the Swedish ghost's translated monologue and focusing on a key fact. The ghost mentions a radio drama from 75 years ago. Yes, the radio drama from 75 years ago was true. This 75 years ago line is mentioned twice in the monologue, which highlights the importance of that specific number. It's likely that the radio drama being mentioned here is the War of the Worlds broadcast from October 30th, 1938. And going by the 75 years ago line, that means the events in PT are occurring on October 30th to 31st, 2013. We say 30th to 31st because in PT, the clock is switching between the 30th at 2359 and the 31st at midnight. Using this as a baseline, we can come up with the dates for the major events in PT, so let's go through them one by one. October 30th to 31st, 1938 the date that the War of the Worlds broadcast and the public reaction to it occur, which is referenced twice by the Swedish radio announcer in the area just before the Red Hallway. Fun note, the crazed public reaction, where thousands of people were convinced that aliens were landing on Earth, has been overplayed by history. Very few people were actually fooled into hysteria. Before or during 1983, Lisa marries her fiancé. Pictures from this wedding can be seen in the repeating hallway. This is an assumption made by presuming that Lisa and her husband would marry before or during the year they have their first child. 1983, Lisa and her husband have their first child, a boy with the first initial of J. We get this date by taking the year that PT occurs, 2013, and subtracting 20 years from it because of J's note about him being unable to forget the date his father killed his family, which was 20 years ago, which is 1993. After that, we simply take the age of Jay at the time of his death, 10 years old, and subtract that number from 1993, which gives us Jay's birth year, 1983. 1987, Lisa and her husband have their second child, a girl. This date is reached with the same method as Jay's birth year, but instead subtracting the girl's age at the time of her death, 6, from 1993. December 1992. The third family referenced by the radio broadcast is murdered at the hands of that family's father. And in December last year, a man used a rifle and meat cleaver to murder his entire family. Since the date of the broadcast seems to be soon after the murder of Lisa's family, it's safe to say the year of the broadcast is 1993. So, December last year would be December of 1992. Since a rifle and meat cleaver were used here, it's likely that the audio we heard in the red hallway peephole scene is from this event. This is because you can clearly hear the sound of a blade of some sort being used to kill a woman. <laughs> the father of this family might be deceased, possibly hanging himself with a garden hose in the garage. The radio isn't clear about which of the fathers did this to himself, but there's a chance this father did it. December 1992. Lisa's husband loses his job. Depressed, he begins drinking heavily. This date is reached by listening to Jay's monologue when he's possessing the sink fetus. You got fired, so you drowned your sorrows in booze. She had to get a part-time job working a grocery store cash register. Only reason she could earn a wage at all is the manager liked how she looked in a skirt. You remember, right? Exactly 10 months back. The reference point for 10 months back isn't specific, but it seems to be the date Jay's family is murdered considering it's the only date that makes any sense. I mean, 10 months back from the date PT occurs is December 2012, well after Lisa died, and I'm pretty sure a dead person can't get a job, as Jay explained. It's also notable that the December 1992 date coincides with Lisa's pregnancy very well, which we'll see in a moment. Wednesday to Thursday, December 30th to 31st, 1992. With her husband still jobless and the family in need of income, Lisa gets a job at a grocery store working the cash register. Her manager is possibly interested in her sexually, and Lisa gets pregnant at some point after this. It is unclear exactly how far into the pregnancy Lisa was at the time of her death, so we have no way of knowing when the conception of her third child occurred. 
The specific dates of December 30th to 31st comes from the line in Jay's sink fetus monologue, exactly 10 months back. It's notable that Jay says exactly, and if the date at which Jay delivers this line is the same day he and Lisa were killed, that would mean the things Jay is referencing occurred on December 30th to 31st, 1992. If this theory is correct, the date at which the events in the Red Hallway occur is a different date than the other loops. This can be explained by saying that time is being altered in the Red Hallway loop, which can be inferred by considering how fast the player character moves before Jay talks to us. September 1993. The second family referenced by the radio broadcast is murdered at the hands of their father. According to the radio report, this murder occurred the month before the murder of Lisa's family, which was October 1993, and the father used a gun. Like the other family's father, this father might have been the guy who hung himself with a garden hose in the garage. Early in the week of October 29th, 1993, Lisa's husband is heard by neighbors to be saying 204863 in a, quote, loud voice. Loud voice being key here, it is possible the husband was possessed, as evidenced by the monster inside me note Lisa's husband left after her murder. It's also possible he was just not himself for some reason, or became obsessed with the number 204863. The date for this comes from the radio report, specifically referencing Lisa's husband acting oddly, quote, several days before the murders. Friday, October 29, 1993. Lisa's husband purchases a rifle from a local gun store. Evidence for this comes from the radio report, which specifically mentions Lisa's husband buying a rifle from a local gun store two days before he murdered his family. Sunday, October 31st, 1993. Lisa's family is murdered at the hands of Lisa's husband. The murder occurred in the afternoon. Lisa's husband shot a pregnant Lisa in the stomach while she was cleaning up after lunch. Shortly after, 10-year-old son Jay hears the commotion and comes into the kitchen to investigate. His father shoots him with the rifle, killing him. Lisa's daughter, six years old, then hides in the bathroom, but her father lures her out by telling her that they're playing a game. Her father then shoots her in the chest at point-blank range, killing her. Lisa's husband is found by police that day, sitting in the garage listening to the radio. He is potentially still alive, presuming he wasn't given the death penalty afterward. All evidence and timing for these events are provided by the radio report at the beginning of PT. And finally, October 30th to 31st, 2013. 20 years later, the date when the events of PT occur. The last theory we'll discuss is a rather simple one and involves the ending of PT where a line appears that reads, This game is a teaser. It has no direct relation to the main title. Put simply, this could be deliberately misleading. It's possible that the mysteries revolving around PT will be further discussed in Silent Hills. I think that just about covers it. Well, at least for this episode. We'll be recording a podcast soon to detail all the symbolism within PT, as well as other topics we simply didn't have time to cover in this video. Interested in having us chat about specific PT theories? Or did you come up with one you'd like to hear us kick around? Leave it in the comments below, and we'll dig into it on the podcast. 